Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing absolutely fine. I welcome you all today's session of the Hindu newspaper analysis, a session where we have a live discussion on the day's Hindu newspaper while we pick out the most important news stories from both the prelims and the mains examination point of view. Before we begin today's session, there is an extremely important announcement. There is an upcoming workshop which is extremely important for all of you live on the 11th of November at 6 p.m. This will be a workshop exclusively on the Baiju's exam prep app. In this workshop, we will be discussing what should be the best foot forward for the last six months before the prelims exam of 2024 comes in your way. Do attend this workshop, register for this by using the link given in the description of the video. These are the topics that we have taken up for today's discussion. From the mains exam point of view, there are a, about four articles that we have taken up. The first one written by Mr. Shashi Tharoor, he talks about a part of our colonial history, how a lot of Indians were taken to many parts of the world, more specifically to Sri Lanka, in the form of indentured laborers. He talks about how those Indian Tamils that went to Sri Lanka in the form of indentured laborers still face discrimination. Even now, they do not have all the rights given to them. Then we'll be discussing about a hypothetical situation. The author here says that in case, let's say there is a US-China conflict over Taiwan. What will be India's option? Would India go ahead with a naval blockade? If yes, then what will be the way out? Third article is about the concept of EFIR, something that has been suggested recently by the Law Commission of India. We'll be discussing what are the recommendations of the Law Commission. Are they right or are there some loopholes in that recommendation? Then we'll be discussing what the concept of loss and damage fund. Again, one of those topics are related to finance of climate change or climate financing, how to stop the climate change, how to adapt against it, how the countries, the developed countries specifically, must contribute more funds to help the developing nations. From the prelims exam point of view, the first article will be about how Another state, that is Kerala, has again gone to the Supreme Court against their own governor. Just a few days back, we discussed the same kind of issue with Tamil Nadu, where Tamil Nadu appointed the Supreme Court against their own governor. Now, Kerala has again done this. And I'm saying this again. Why? Because Kerala went to Supreme Court just a couple of weeks before as well against their own governor. Then, Kerala again has formed an organic farming mission to boost its agriculture. We'll be discussing the details of that as well. Then there's a report that has come out by multiple organizations that talks about how the world will certainly overshoot the 2030 fossil fuel limit by at least twice, despite the countries making tall claims against it. And then in the end, we'll be discussing about India's guidelines on genetically modified insects. We usually talk about genetically modified crops, genetically modified organisms, but genetically modified insects is a new topic. There's an article written on that, why we need to change our policy with regards to that. Let's begin then. The first article written by Mr. Shashi Tharoor is about a very interesting part of India's history. He says that when the British were ruling over India, they utilized India's population by taking Indians as indentured laborers to many, many parts of the world. In this article, more specifically, he is focusing on Sri Lanka. He says that most of the colonial powers, more specifically the British, they use a lot of their colonies for slavery. British, for example, were indulgent in slavery for a long, long time. They took slaves from Africa. They sold them to various parts of the world. When there was a lot of criticism of the British, they said that, okay, we are abolishing slavery. But even when slavery was abolished, it was replaced by something called indentured laborers. Now, indentured laborers, the concept of laborers as against the slaves is, slaves on the other hand, or slaves on one hand do not get paid. They are hereditary, the property of the master. So, for example, if there is a slave owned by a person, the slave's children, the next generation will all be owned by the master. Indentured laborers do not mean the same. Indentured laborers means that you will be paid a certain amount, although very, very low amount. All the indentured laborers are taken as laborers for a specific period of time. Let's say there's a contract for 10 years or 20 or 15 or whatever number of years. 
Once the contract comes to an end, the laborer has the right to demand that now I want to go back to my own place, to my own country, at least on paper. That is the idea of indentured laborers. Now, what has Mr. Shashi Tharoor written here? He has written about how Indian indentured laborers, especially from the colonial state of Madras, were taken to Sri Lanka for their tea plantation. They were then regarded as second grade citizens in that part of the world, in Ceylon at that point of time. And after Sri Lanka's independence in 1948, even after that, the citizens of India who were taken to Sri Lanka about a couple of centuries earlier, even now they do not have enough rights. Even now they are not being treated equally as compared to their local Sinhali population. This is what this article explores. Why has he written this article? Because this year marks the 200th year anniversary of Tamil indentured laborers that were taken to Sri Lanka by the British starting from November of 1823. Now, as I said, the British for a very, very long time had been indulging in slavery. It was an extremely profitable business for them. They used to take slaves from Africa, they sell them to various parts of the world, in Europe, etc., to work in plantation, to work in other jobs. And they earned a lot of profit doing that. However, as we evolved, as the British saw a lot of criticism against this idea of slavery, the British said, okay, we will abolish slavery and we'll replace it with something called indentured laborers. Countries such as India, with a huge population even then, was a very attractive place for the British to employ these laborers and send them to various colonies of the British. Thus, Indians were taken to various parts of the world, including Caribbean islands, Fiji, the Iranian islands that are, owned by, that are controlled by France, later on Natal, that is in South Africa, Malaysia, Singapore. All these places saw a lot of Indians being taken as laborers. Now, this is also one of the reasons why even today, doesn't matter which part of the world you go in, you will find a person of Indian origin. Doesn't matter which country you go to, you will find someone who is of Indian origin no matter what. Now, these laborers, at least on paper, were better than slaves. They were promised certain salary, they were promised after some time you can come back, but in reality, it was not the case. Mr. Tharoor in this article says that they were often lied about what wages will they be given. They were even lied about where are they being taken. For example, laborers would be told that we are just taking you to Sri Lanka, get on the ship. They would get on the ship and before they know it, they might end up in some other country altogether because they would not know where they are going. On top of that was the laborers themselves that were forced to pay the fees of sea fare, the ticket price when they were leaving. The living conditions were very, very bad because at the end of the day, the British wanted to earn as much profit as possible. When they reached Sri Lanka, in many of these laborers who were taken to Sri Lanka, there were no facilities for their children, there were no schools, etc. There were no sanitation facilities, there was no running water, absolutely zero medical facilities because again at the end of the day, the objective of the British was never the welfare of these laborers. The objective was to earn as much profit as possible. Let's look at this situation from the Sri Lankan point of view now. Sri Lanka had always had a very big coffee plantation. It was more known for coffee than tea. However, it all changed in 1870s. In 1870s, there was a fungal disease that started to spread in Sri Lanka that hurt the coffee plantation significantly. This is why most of the plantation owners shifted their focus towards tea. The big difference is if you compare tea and coffee plantation, the number of laborers required in a tea plantation are significantly more as compared to laborers required in coffee plantation. They have to pick tea leaves, these have to be picked up individually, they have to be inspected. So it's a lot more work when you own a tea plantation. For example, in coffee plantation, if for 10 hectares you required only three workers, for tea plantation required eight workers at least. Means there was a lot more demand for laborers in Sri Lanka and that demand was then fulfilled by the British to the indentured laborers that were taken from India. However, these people who were taken from India were never considered equal to the Sri Lankan citizens. They were in fact named as the Indian Tamils. 
they were categorized specially as aliens, as strangers. When Sri Lanka became independent, they passed a Citizenship Act of 1948. In that act, they did not even recognize the citizenship right of the Indian Tamils. Some of these Tamils were in Sri Lanka for over 100 years now. And all of a sudden, when Sri Lankan government passed a law, they said that we don't recognize them as citizens, they should go back. In fact, that has become the crux of the problem which led eventually to the civil war in Sri Lanka. Add to that, there was also a problem of Kanganis. Now, what are Kanganis? Kanganis were basically the middlemen, the subcontractors. So, for example, let's say there was a laborer who was taken to Sri Lanka. Now, this laborer, maybe it was taken by the British or he was taken by the British at first, but when he had to change his job, let's say in Sri Lanka, he could not find a job on his own. So he had to get in touch with these middlemen subcontractors called Kanganis. What will they do? They will be the one who will act as the mediator between the plantation owner and these laborers. The problem was most of the wages given to the laborers were actually taken in the pocket of the Kanganis. They played a dominant role in managing all these labors. They exploited them. They did not pay them enough money. They took the laborers everywhere with them. And they did not allow them to even have an iota of any kind of luxury or any kind of even basic amenities. So with time, the situation of these indentured laborers who were taken to Sri Lanka deteriorated even further. Now, despite all of these, the plantation workers who were taken there, they thought that, okay, maybe this is the way of life. Maybe we have to settle there. And they did try their best as per Shashi Tharoor. They did try to identify themselves with the Tamil language, with the literary traditions. They started to respect the traditions of Sri Lanka. They started to strive towards having a peaceful life there. But soon after independence in 1948, when they were not given independence, all of those efforts went into vain. And as I said, this later on culminated into the eventual deadly civil war in Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan government for a long, long time never realized or never recognized the rights of the Indian Tamils to exist and to be the citizens of Sri Lanka. When the Sri Lankan army committed atrocities against the Indian Tamils, against these indentured laborers and their next generations, many of these formed militant groups amongst themselves. The most famous one of these was the LTTE. And as you know, the civil war commenced between the LTT and the Sri Lankan military. It was the Indian government under Rajiv Gandhi that mediated, that signed a peace agreement between Sri Lanka and making sure to ensure, made sure that there is a ceasefire between the LTT and the Sri Lankan military. There was an Indian peacekeeping unit also that was sent to Sri Lanka. Now, in all of this discussion between India and Sri Lanka, how India came in between to sign this peace accord. There is a lot of discussion about something called the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment of the Sri Lankan Constitution. The 13th Amendment is an amendment that Sri Lankan government agreed to carry out to give rights to the Tamil population, to treat them as equal citizens. It was in 1987 that India and Sri Lanka had signed this peace accord under which Sri Lankan government agreed they will give more powers to the provinces where the Tamil population is in majority, mostly the northern provinces of Sri Lanka. But the problem is even today, if you see the news articles, there are demands that the 13th Amendment should be implemented properly. Even today, the critics of the Sri Lankan government say that they have not implemented the 13th Amendment properly. Even today, they have not given the proper rights to the Tamil population as they should. And this issue remains unresolved even today. 13th Amendment again is a very famous provision of the Sri Lankan constitution that keeps on coming up in the discussion time and time again. It was a result of the 1987 India-Sri Lanka peace accord. Now, there are many people who criticize India's action. There are many people who criticize India signing this peace accord. The reason is, if the peace accord was to bring a ceasefire between Sri Lanka and LTTE, if there are two parties that are fighting with each other and there is an agreement that should be signed to bring peace between the two, 
ideally these two should be the ones who should sign the peace accord right if Sri Lanka is fighting LTTE and we want both of these to stop fighting these two parties should sign the peace accord but that did not happen what happened was peace accord was signed between Sri Lanka and India in other words India was considered as a representative of the LTTE that became a problem because Indian government could not control the activities of the LTTE. They thought that Indian government is not looking after their interests. They broke the ceasefire and the Sri Lankan also retaliated. Leaving our military in the middle as the peacekeeping force where they had to face fire from both the sides. As you can see here, the 13th Amendment still remains in the news time and time again. There are still news of discrimination between the Tamil population or to the Tamil population at the hands of the majority Sinhalese population. I'll suggest you something. Recently there's a movie that has come out. I don't know how many of you have seen the trailer. If you follow cricket you will know Muthaya Murli Dharan. So there's a movie that has come out on his life. I think the movie's name is 800. He, this is the number of wickets he took in test cricket. And it's a story of him, the struggles that he faced. And in that movie he talks about the struggles that he faced because he was a Tamilian living in Sri Lanka. The discrimination that he faced, how he could not get selected for a long, long time. And he talks about the pop, the problem that the Tamil population faces in Sri Lanka day in and day out. So it is the reality and you can see that in the movie itself. Now to the second article. The second article here again, let me first tell you, this is an hypothetical situation which the author has made up. The author here is a director general of Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies. So basically, these kind of defense think tanks, what they do is they make up situations. They make up hypothetical situations that if this happens in the future, what we should do. If this is what India does, then what will be the impact from China? What will be the consequences? So here also he has taken a hypothetical situation. He says that let's assume there is a situation that there is a US-China conflict over Taiwan. As you know, China wants to make Taiwan a part of the Chinese mainland. US supports Taiwan. So he says hypothetically, if there is a conflict between the US and China and Taiwan, that is in our region, what will be India's options? What can India do? He says that can India ensure that we block the Malacca Strait. What if we, India blocks the Malacca Strait? Would the Chinese merchant vessels now have a problem? Because China's trade, especially to West Asia, to Africa, depends a lot on the Malacca Strait. Most of this goes to Malacca Strait only. Just in case you don't know what is Malacca Strait, let me first show you the map and then we'll go back here. So this is the Strait of Malacca, or the Malacca Strait. This is a very narrow strip that exists here between Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. So this is the area, the state of Malacca. So if this is China, for example, for China to trade with West Asia, let's say the oil that they buy from Iran or Saudi Arabia, that oil has to come all the way, take this route only to reach China. This is where this entire trade route is extremely important for many, many countries, including China. Now, the author here says that India has an advantage here. Why? Look at the Andaman Nicobar Islands. The Andaman Nicobar Islands, again, they are the last of these islands. If you see, they are very, very close to Indonesia. So India has its navy present here in large numbers. He says that what if, if a situation arises that there is a US-China conflict, can India explore the option of blocking the state of Malacca? Can we block this to our Navy so that the Chinese vessels cannot come here so that their trade is impacted? This is a situation, a hypothetical situation that he has made up. That what if India takes a state action on the state of Malacca? What if we block the Chinese vessels? What will be the implication? So on one hand, he's making up this situation that what if India does this? And on the other hand, he is saying that this would not be possible. He is saying that there are a lot of factors that we are not considering because of it, this action will not be possible. What are the suggestions, what are the implications he is telling? He is saying first, distant blockades away from the nation's geography will be challenged under international law. 
So basically the international law is, let's say if China is the guilty party, okay? For example, China attacks Taiwan and the world says that this is wrong, we should not allow China to do this, we should have a blockade of China. Even if that happens, even when the world says we should blockade China, that blockade can only happen in the Chinese mainland, near the Chinese mainland. You cannot block a territory far away from a country to punish that country, number one. Second problem, he says, this is not just China's important trade route. If you look at this trade route, this is extremely important for many countries, Japan, South Korea, India itself. Many countries use this for their trading purposes. A bulk of the world's trade actually goes through this. Can you afford to just block this? Third, the channel is again, it's long about 500 miles. Means there are other countries involved here. Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia. Would they allow you to take such a step? Most of these are close friends of China. Would they allow India or even the US for that matter? to come and just have a blockade on the state of Malacca. Third, fourth, commercial shipping again, it's very difficult to identify them. Difficult to identify which are the ships that are commercial, that are carrying certain goods and which are the ships that are military. Would you be able to identify between those? Would you be able to block certain ships and let the other ships go? Fifth, there's always an option of a detour that China can take, especially through the Sunda state. Let me first show you where exactly it is. So again, if you see the map here, look at this. So this is another state called the Sunda state. This is in between Indonesia only. China, in fact, uses this as well for their trading purposes. Most of their trade goes to state of Malacca, but they also use this part that is the Sunda state. So China also has an alternate way which they use. They also use this Lombok state as well from time to time whenever they want to. So it is good to think or it is fine to think that you can block the state of Malacca, but China always has some other option. For example, when China carries very large crude carriers, they do not use the state of Malacca because it does not have that much depth. If you want very huge ships to go through some waterway, you, it has to have certain depth. State of Malacca is not very deep. So huge Chinese ships don't go from there anyway. They use a Sunda street. Problem number six, China has its own strategic petroleum reserve. So if you are thinking that you can block oil supply to China by blocking this way, Iran, Saudi Arabia will not be able to supply oil to China. You are mistaken because number one, China is buying a lot of oil from Russia as well. And second, they also have their own strategic petroleum reserves. So it's not that if you stop buy, if you stop oil from being supplied to China, you would be able to bring them on their knees. Last point, China also is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which they can utilize to ensure that any such action is blocked anyway. So again, it's a hypothetical situation that the author has made up. That if this happens, can India afford to block the state of Malacca? And then he himself is giving pointers. Why is it not possible to just block the state of Malacca? He also says that in the past, whenever this blockade thing has been employed by any country, it has led to a lot of violent repercussions. In both the world wars, World War I, World War II, there was some blockade that was tried or that was attempted by certain countries and it led to just the war becoming even more devastating. In the First World War, British blockaded Germany. Germany retaliated by using their submarines called the U-boats. These submarines attacked one of the US merchant vessel as well, killing a lot of US citizens, which forced the US also to enter into the First World War. Similarly, in the Second World War, US had kind of tried to blockade Japan's energy supplies. In return, the Japanese planned an attack on the Pearl Harbor, which eventually led to the US throwing the first ever atomic bomb on Japan. So in the past, whenever there has been a war and a country has tried to have blockade over the other country to stop their supplies, it has never ended well. It has never ended with peace. Thus, these conflicting scenarios would only become worse with time. That is why in case there is a full-blown conflict, 
over Taiwan between US and China. India has to take a position, but rather than thinking of blockading the state of Malacca, it would be better for India to look at other means to have better relationship with a neighboring country so that we can together come up with a solution rather than India just taking one stand against China because it will not work in the future. Now there's something else also that I want to discuss with you. Recently, there was a BRI summit that is a Belt and Road Initiative summit held by Xi Jinping. A lot of countries, their leaders attended that summit. One of the leaders who attended that summit was the Thailand Prime Minister. Now Thailand's Prime Minister, when he was sitting, there was a camera that caught something that he was drawing. He was just doodling on a piece of paper. Now what exactly is he doodling? Let's try and understand why am I discussing this with you. This roughly is a map of Thailand. So if you see this, roughly this is a map of Thailand. I'll just show you this. So if you can see, roughly basically this is what Thailand is. So roughly this is a map of Thailand. So basically there has long been an idea in Thailand that can we provide an alternate to the state of Malacca. The idea is from here can we have a connectivity somewhere here. So for example if you go back what if somewhere here let's say somewhere here can there be a state that can be built artificially. For example there is a Swiss canal. If you look at the Swiss canal, what is it? It's an artificial canal built in Egypt to make the trade much easier, much simpler. The idea in Thailand also for a long time is what if we can just break off this part and ask the Chinese rather than using the state of Malacca, use this part. Now this is again not a new idea, please understand. This is not a new idea that Thailand Prime Minister has given. This is an idea that many people in Thailand have given already in the past as well. Now, what is he doing here? He has said that there is an alternate to it. Rather than building an entire canal because it can be expensive, it can be harmful to the environment as well. Why not, rather than having a canal, basically build a kind of a connectivity passage. Let's say build a port here, port number one here, port number two here. And in between there can be roadways, there can be railways, there can be other forms of connectivity as well. So rather than breaking this entire thing, why not just have, let's say, connectivity so that the two bridges or the two ports can be formed in either way. He was present at this Belt and Road Initiative Summit a few days back where he was drawing this. Means he has raised this idea with China once again. Why has he raised this with China? Because these kind of projects take a lot of money. And who has the money for these projects? Obviously China. So Thailand is suggesting something to China. It will cost a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars. Whether China is ready and interested to do that remains to be seen. If it does happen, it will be a very, very interesting development in this region that China will certainly like. So again, as you can see, this is where, for example, the idea is. Again, very, very close to India. This is the Andaman Sea. This is the Andaman Islands. If you can see here, this is where the idea is. So this is Thailand. This is where the idea is that we can provide alternate connectivity rather than going to the state of Malacca. The countries can use this as well. The next article that we have here is on the concept of EFIR. It is a concept that was very recently suggested by the Law Commission of India. Now what does the Law Commission of India say? Basically, the Law Commission of India says that there should be a concept of EFIRs allowed. Now, in simple terms, you might think EFIR is filing the FIR online. And you're not wrong. EFIR in simple terms means filing the FIR online. See, right now, when you have to go to the police station to get your FIR file, there are a lot of problems with that. You would have heard many people tell filing an FIR is not easy. The police does not file an FIR. They don't want to increase the number of complaints registered. Because any police station is judged on the basis of how many cases have come up in this area. If they don't file any, any FIR, that means they can tell the senior, see there is no pro crime problem in our place. So we do not, how we have done brilliantly. That means that the police do not make it easy usually for you to file an FIR. 
So the alternate method can be to have EFIRs filed. Now, what has the law commission recommended? Let's look at this. Law commission has said in case where accused is not known, means, for example, let's say something wrong happened. You don't know who did this. You don't know who is the person who has done this to you. You should be allowed to file an EFIR for the cognizable offense. Now, what are cognizable offenses? Let's first try and understand that. So there are certain words that you must remember and understand. For example, cognizable offense are serious offenses where a person can be arrested even without a warrant. Non-cognizable are the ones which are not that serious where the police has to get a warrant. You would have seen this in the movies where police goes to arrest someone and the person says, do you have a warrant or not? First show me the warrant only then I'll come. But that is not applicable in all the cases. Let's assume the situation where a person has committed a murder and police sees this. In front of them, they see a person committing a murder. And when the police go and arrest them, would the police or would they say, tell the police, first show me the warrant? Obviously not. When the 9-11 Mumbai terror attacks happened, when the police arrested a terrorist, Ajmal Kasab, when the police is arresting him, would he first say, no, 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 first show me the warrant. Only then I will come. No, obviously not. Why? Because those are cognizable offenses. So cognizable offenses are the ones that are considered serious offenses where the police does not require a warrant for the arrest. So law commission says in case of cognizable offenses, when the accused is not known, registration of EFIR should be allowed. On the other hand, if the accused is known, when you know who has done this, when you think that you know the person who has done this, registration of EFIR may be allowed for cognizable offenses where the punishment provided under the IPC is up to three years. So if you know the accused, then you can file an EFIR for cognizable offenses where punishment is only up to maximum three years. If you don't know the accused, then the law commission says everyone should be allowed to file an EFIR irrespective of any offense. Third, how is this complaint verified? So the problem with EFIR, why many states don't allow this, is that how do you identify whether the complaint is serious or not? See, in India, in our society, everyone would just play a prank. They would just file any FIR, file any complaint that they want if they think that they will remain anonymous. So how do you tackle this problem? It has to be verified. Now, how do you verify this? As per law commission, verification should be done by mobile number through the OTP and mandating the ID proof such as the Aadhaar card. Apart from that, the name of the suspect on the centralized national portal will be secured unless the EFIR is signed by the complainant. Now, this is important. Means, even when you have filed the EFIR, the police will ask you, the police will contact you to sign on that complaint. Only when you sign on the complaint, after that only, the police will start the investigation. In case of registered information, not signed by the informant. If you have not signed it after complaining, it will be deleted within two weeks. So even when you file the EFIR, the police will come to you, ask you to sign it so that they will start the investigation. If you don't sign it within the prescribed time period, within two weeks, your complaint will be deleted. Now, this is how the EFIR works. Now, EFIR as a concept is followed in eight states right now as per the author. The author says that there is there are a few states that are following this. So right now what happens when you file an EFIR, the police will basically have about three days of time. Within three days, the police will come to get your signature. The complainant has to put the signature on the complaint within three days. If it is not given, the signature is not given within three days, then the complaint will not be registered. It will be deleted automatically. So in a way, the FIRs are just a way for you to file a complaint online when you think the police will not take your complaint. The author says there are a few benefits and then he talks about the negative pointers. He first talks about the benefits. The benefits that he says are, number one, the police will have to file the complaint no matter what. Means when you go to the police station, many times the police discourages you to file in the complaint. The police does not want to increase their own workload. 
but in case of FIR, the police has no option but to start the investigation. So, this is one benefit. Second benefit is it will ensure that there is no change in the contents of the complaint. That also is a problem. Many times when people file a complaint, after a few days they say, no, no, I want to change the complaint. This is not what happened. Something else happened. At least when you're filing it online in the form of EFIR, there will be no option to change the complaint or the contents of the complaint later on. These are the benefits. However, as per the author, in police investigation, you cannot ignore the role of human beings. You cannot ignore the role of police officers. For example, first, the accused may be initially unknown in case of kidnapping, where immediate medical examination of the victim may be important. Means, for example, when someone has been arrested or any of these crimes, it is important that immediately the action must start. Immediately there has to be investigation because the earlier you start the investigation, the better it is. Now, imagine a situation where a crime has been committed. You file an EFIR. There is a three-day time period. Within these three days, you first have to sign on that and then the police will start the investigation. So three precious days are lost after the crime has been committed. As for the author, the later the investigation begins, lesser are the chances of the case being solved. Second, a police officer who is experienced may extract a lot of information from the complainant if they are able to question them physically. Postponing all these things, postponing of questioning, postponing of investigation, even by only three days, can have a very, very negative impact. It can impact the eventual outcome of the investigation. If you're not allowing the police officer to investigate the matter, it will become problematic. The author suggests that why do we have to get into this, com this signature signing thing? The author says there are so many other ways in which now you can actually ascertain whether the person is filing the complaint in a proper manner or not. If you want to authenticate a person's identity, there are so many other ways. For example, those of you who sign, who file the income tax return, you would know online when you file the ITR income tax return, you have to authenticate yourself. How do you do that? Through Aadhaar, through OTP, Aadhaar, KYC services. That is done immediately. You don't have to sign on this physically. You can have Aadhaar registered OTP using which you can actually get yourself authenticated. So this is a way in which you can authenticate someone's identity immediately. This can be a much, much better way forward as per the author. Rather than waiting for three days for the police to get the complaints or the complainant signature physically, that will only delay the entire process. This is a problem. Again, these are only the recommendations of the Law Commission of India that EFIRs should be allowed in these kind of cases. Whether the government accepts this or not remains to be seen. This is what the Law Commission has said that for all the cognizable offences across the entire country, EFIRs should be allowed to be filed, especially in case the accused is unknown. These are certain words that you must know. We already discussed cognizable, non-cognizable. Then there are words such as bailable offenses, non-bailable offenses. Many people think non-bailable means you would not get a bail. That is not true. Bailable means you will get the bail. It is your right to get the bail. You just submit the paperwork. Non-bailable means the court decides whether they will want to give you the bail or not. Then there's compoundable and non-compoundable offenses. Compoundable offense means that can be settled outside the court. Let's take an example. Let's say someone has committed a murder. Now, after you commit the murder, if you, let's say, ask for forgiveness from the family member of the person who has been killed, you ask them, please forgive me. Even if the family members say, okay, I forgive you. That does not mean the case will be solved. The case eventually will be solved in the court only. The court only has to give the decision. Those are called non-compoundable. They have to be solved in the court only. They cannot be settled outside court. Then there are certain cases that can be settled outside court as well. Like traveling without ticket, etc. They can be settled outside court. Those are called compoundable offenses. Now a slight word on the Law Commission of India, whose report is a centerpiece of this article. The Law Commission of India, as you know, prepares a lot of reports. Mainly, it's an advisory body. 
that advises the government on different types of laws and policies that should be introduced. It also keeps or it also checks the existing laws, suggests to the government, gives a feedback to the government about how efficient the current laws are. In fact, the recent debate on the Uniform Civil Code has begun in India because it was the Law Commission of India that asked the common people to give their feedback on what the Uniform Civil Code should look like. It's a very old body established by the British in 1834 after the Charter Act of 1833 was passed. Right now, it has a full-time chairperson. Apart from that, the commission has four full-time members, which includes a member secretary as well. These are usually bureaucrats that are working for the government of India. It will have, it can have a maximum of five part-time members as well. Retired Supreme Court judge or the Chief Justice of a High Court will be the head of this commission. Again, their recommendations are not binding. They just suggest to the government what are the new laws that can be introduced. The next article is again on the idea of climate financing about how the developed world should take up more responsibility which it has not done sadly so far. The topic is on the idea of loss and damage funds also known as l &D funds. The unfortunate part is it's nothing new that's written in this article. It's something that we have discussed time and time again. We have discussed how the world, the developing countries need a lot of money to, trans to have a transition towards clean energy, towards renewable form of energy. However, where would that money come from? That remains a matter of great debate. Developed world is not ready to take up the responsibility, although it has been proven without any doubt that they are the ones who are mainly responsible for this climate issue that we are facing right now. For this, the countries around the world thought of establishing something called the Loss and Damage Fund. The idea first came up in 2013 at the UNFCCC conference in Poland, where the countries decided to set up a Loss and Damage Fund means countries that have faced damage and loss due to climate change, like the flash floods that we see, those countries should be getting compensation from this fund for redevelopment of their infrastructure. But the problem is the idea may seem to be noble, but the developed world that should take the responsibility has not taken up the responsibility or has not promised contributing funds to this. None of the countries have committed any funds despite this being the matter of discussion time and time again. For example, the last meeting that was concluded in October 20, just about 15 days back, there was again no consensus on where the funds will come from. There is also a debate about who will manage the funds. Developed world wants the World Bank to manage the funds. Now, what do you mean by manage the funds? For example, if the nations have contributed together $100 billion, where will this be kept? Who will make sure that it is audited properly? Who will make sure that it is being run as per the accepted norms? Developed world wants the World Bank to do this. Developing countries agreed to this, but the problem is institutions such as the World Bank, if you ask them that please take care of this fund, they don't do it for free. They in fact charge a good fee from this. They charge a good fee from this. They say, okay, we'll take care of this, but we will charge a fee to oversee how the funds are. Now, anyways, we are not getting enough funds. On top of that, you have the World Bank charging a fee to take care of the little amount. That becomes even more challenging. The developed world have not been committed about this. They keep on talking about how there is a need to go towards cleaner fuel, how there is a need to now adopt renewable forms of energy, but they have not been living up to the promises that they have made. They expect the developing world, they expect the least developed countries to make changes on their own, rather than accepting the responsibility that we have to pay for this. It has been proven beyond any doubt that it was the beginning of the industrial revolution that started the problem of climate change, global warming around the world. Western countries, the US, European countries have been responsible for that. But even then, they have not been able to fulfill their obligations. There has been very, it, there have been very limited funds that have been diverted to fight against this climate change. 
countries around the world, especially the small island countries have been speaking up against it. For example, a few years back in Maldives, the Maldives government held a cabinet meeting underwater. They're all wearing scuba suits to show the world that if we don't take any action against climate change, this will be the reality in the coming years. And this is a reality of many, many countries. There are many countries around the world, even countries such as Thailand, Indonesia, that are facing a problem under which many of their cities will be submerged under the sea if the climate change threat is not taken seriously. But even then, we do not see any change in how the developed world has been thinking about this. So far, most of the climate funding has been focused on cutting the carbon dioxide emissions. But we have not given enough funds to adaptation. Please understand there are two different words, adaptation and mitigation. Mitigation means, for example, how to reduce the temperature of the earth. How to make sure temperature of the earth does not increase. That is called mitigation. So, for example, cutting down on CO2 emissions, focusing on renewable energy, focusing on solar energy, that will be under mitigation. Adaptation means... Now the impact of climate change has been seen. Now how do we live with that? How do we build houses that are able to withstand the new reality? We know that the temperature has increased already. We cannot bring it back. How do we now learn to live with it? That is called adaptation, adapting with it. The problem is most of the developed world wants to focus only on mitigation. For developed world, they think that mitigation should be our topmost priority. It is a developing world that wants focus on adaptation as well. How do we adapt to the change reality? How do we make sure that in this change reality, we have enough resources to live a successful life? As you can see, there are billions and billions of dollars that have been lost in all these natural disasters. Last year, we saw the floods in Pakistan. Over 1,700 people died. There was a loss of $3 billion. There was Northwest US that saw heat waves in June, July 2021, leading to 1,400 people dying. New, again, the US having $75 billion of loss due to hurricane. All these are undeniable impacts and consequences of climate change, which have not been handled properly with, by the developed world. Then from the Pillars point of view, we have a few news stories starting from once again focusing on Kerala. A few days back, if you remember, we had discussed a news story that the Tamil Nadu government has gone to Supreme Court against their own governor. Why? Because they think that the governor is not signing on the bills, deliberately denying the bills or deliberately delaying all the bills. Exactly the same is the case with Kerala now. Kerala, interestingly, went to Supreme Court against their governor just a couple of weeks back. Once again, they have gone back to the Supreme Court. They have said that the governor is defeating the rights of the people. They are saying that the governor is violating the fundamental rights of the people by deliberately delaying the bills, by arbitrarily not signing on the bills that are important to provide relief to the people after the COVID-19 health crisis. Now, this is not something new. The debate about the office of the governor especially in the states that are ruled by the non-BJP party, is a very old debate or any party that is not at the center. The office of the governor has been an extremely important topic for the prelims and from the mains exam point of view, especially the mains exam. Do read about this in detail. Do read the recommendation of Sarkaria Commission, Panchi Commission, what have they said, how to revive and how to reform the office of the governor. Now, as you know, governor is the official head of the state whose assent is necessary to bring any bill into a law. Now, under article number 200, the governor has the power to give assent to the bill. The problem and the crux of the entire matter is there is no time limit within which the governor must sign on the bills. And this is where the problem becomes even worse for these states. Kerala is not the only state facing such a problem. Just a few days back, we discussed about Tamil Nadu. Then there are states such as Punjab that have complained 
Then there is a state such as Telangana that they have also complained time and time again that the governors are just not signing on the bills even though they are pending for many, many, many months. The Supreme Court in case of Telangana had to intervene and ask the governor to clear the bills that are pending since September 2022. So again, it is a reality that the office of the governor has been politicized. Office of the governor works more on the directions given by the central government rather than the interest of the state government that has become the crux of the entire matter. Now, the articles that govern this relationship of the governor with the legislature are 200 and 201. As you know, article number 200 talks about the power of the governor to give assent to the bill, to withhold assent or reserve a bill for the president of India. The problem is in any of these cases, there is no time limit. In fact, there have been cases where governor has sent a bill back to the assembly using suspensive veto. The assembly has sent the bill back. Even on the second occasion, the governor has not signed it. Although the governor must sign on the bill when it comes back again after reconsideration. But even in that case, the governors have been taking their own sweet time without even signing it. Article 201 talks about how the bill can be reserved for the president of India also under certain circumstances. President again has no time limit. Now, as you know, the governor has this special power of reserving certain bills for the president of India, asking the president of India to consider these bills. These are the circumstances under which such a bill can be reserved for the president. Please understand something. If there is a bill that is endangering the position of the state high court, any bill trying to endanger the position of the state high court, that bill compulsorily has to be sent to the president. The other situations, in these situations, it depends on the governor. These situations are governor's discretion. If he wants, he can send the bill to the president. If he doesn't want, he may not. But in case the situation of the state high court is endangered, in that case, a governor must send the bill to the president. But in either case, there is no time limit provided. The next article, again from Kerala, the Kerala government is trying to give a boost to organic farming by saying that we will be trying to provide the best quality organic seeds, organic manure to our farmers. They will also divert some of their own state-owned land for organic farming. The Kerala government has set up a mission under which they want to expand organic farming in the state to 5,000 hectare with an annual target of 1,000 hectare every single year. The state government also owns certain land the State Agriculture Department has said at least 10% of the area that they own will see only organic farming practices in the next five years. The organic farming policy of Kerala is not new. It was established in 2010. The Kerala government would also look to market the products that are organic in such a way that they find a bigger market. They will try to certify brand and also market these products from Kerala. Over here, let me give you a very small and easy homework. Do find out the first Indian state to go fully organic and let me know in the comment section later on. The first Indian state to go 100% organic, which is that, when did they do it? Is it successful or not? Just read about it and let me know in the comment section. The next article is about a sad report that has come out reporting that the world will overshoot the fossil fuel limit 2030 by at least twice. What is this report all about? This report is called Production Gap Report. So there is a report called the Production Gap Report. It says that despite all the promises made by various countries, be it the net zero target, be it all the promises that they make in solar, renewable energy, etc. The reality is the world will overshoot its target by at least twice in terms of fossil fuel consumption. They are saying that we are nowhere near the limit of restricting our climate change or restricting our temperature limit to 1.5 degrees Celsius. In fact, even the 2 degree target will not be achieved. Despite over 150 countries 
signing a pledge, declaring the net zero target year, even then we are not on track. This report has been prepared by the Stockholm Environment Institute, Climate Analytics, E3G, International Institute for Sustainable Development and the UN Environment Program. They have studied about 20 major fossil fuel producing countries, including India as well. They talk about the production of coal, oil and gas and they have given certain graphs to compare where the target is and where the countries stand. So I looked at the report today and I'll just show you a certain important graphs from this particular report that has come out on their website. If we had to achieve the 1.5 degree Celsius target, the 1.5 degree Celsius target, it has to go this, the fossil fuel production should be somewhere here. This should be the ideal fossil fuel production if we have to achieve the 1.5 degree target. For 2 degree target, this should be the line. And where are we right now? This red line. Imagine the gap in between the two. Similarly, if you see coal production, oil production, gas production, in all of these, 1.5 degree target is here. And this is where the real production is right now. There is a huge gap between where the government stand right now and between what we are trying to achieve. This is what the report points towards. The report also gives this data about the 20 countries that they have studied, the pledge that they have taken, the net zero year that they have targeted, what has been the change in their coal, oil or gas production. All these do not give any pleasing data. If you see here, in fact, let's look at India, coal production has increased. There is no data on oil, there is no data on gas. When the governments don't share data, that usually does not mean good news. Because when there is something positive, the governments usually want to highlight that. The last article that we have here is on India's guidelines with respect to genetically modified insects. Now, first, please understand, the Hindu newspaper many times, they republish their articles. So this also is a republished article. The real article was actually published in July this year. It's a copy paste of what they have done. Many times when they don't have any articles to publish, they want to fill up the space. They just go back to their old articles which are relevant even today and they just republish it. So you might have studied this in July also itself. If not, you can study it here. So this is the same article, nothing new has happened. This is an article that talks about how India has not been focusing on making correct policies with respect to bioeconomics, with respect to genetically modified insects. Now, why is it important to focus on genetically modified organisms, genetically modified insects, etc.? Let's try and understand. So, for example, when the COVID-19 crisis started, we saw the vaccines being made. Now, please understand a lot of these vaccines that we make for different diseases, important components of those vaccines are taken from animals. So we had to work on those animals. Similarly, in many countries around the world, there have been genetically modified mosquitoes that have been created. They would be used to control diseases such as malaria and dengue. So again, genetically modified insects have a lot of potential of not just making sure that we are able to make better vaccine, better products to increase our life expectancy, but also to tackle a lot of diseases. But the government policies as per the author are not in line with this. The author says that in April 2023, the Department of Biotechnology released a report called Bioeconomy Report of 2022, where they said that they want 5% of our GDP by 2030 to come from bioeconomy. At present, it is about 2.6%. Means the government is hoping to earn $220 billion more by 2030 through this bioeconomy. But again, as per the author, not many changes have occurred in the way that we deal with it. As per the author, as at present, the amount of money that is this that is sent for research that is spent on research by the government on bioeconomics is 0.0001% of our GDP. The author says that recently the government released guidelines for genetically engineered insects and there are three big issues with it. 
if we don't fix these three issues, it will be very difficult to expect any jump in the contribution to the GDP. First big issue, there is no certainty of purpose. The guidelines don't specify the purpose for which these insects can be approved in India. As you know, just like genetically modified crops, for genetically modified organisms also, if they have to be created, there has to be a proper method for which the government will give permission. You will have to go ahead and make your case that it is important. Only then the government's committee will look into whether or not these permissions should be given. The problem is there is no specific purpose that talks about under which the government will approve this or not. For example, engineering of honey bees can make better quality honey. It can also reduce our import of honey as well. Silk worm, for example, can be engineered to make cheaper silk also. But the government in their guidelines have not mentioned that. The guidelines only say that we will use this technology to reduce the disease burden. But they don't say that we will use it to earn money as well. That remains problem number one. Second problem, uncertainty for researchers. Means, basically the, the guidelines say, the insects which are made and tested in the laboratory, they cannot be recalled once they have been deployed. For example, if you actually see, any insect, let's say a genetically modified mosquito has been created. They have been now left into the atmosphere, left into the society. You cannot bring them back. So you have to conduct all the trials as much as possible before you actually leave them in the society. The problem here is that the guidelines are applicable only to research and not to trials or deployment. In the trial period also, the guidelines have to be made that you can conduct as many trials as possible because trials in these cases are extremely important. Because once you release this into the market, you cannot take it back. It's not like genetically modified food. Genetically modified food, for example, can be brought back. People can be told that you don't consume this. Government can make a law. This cannot be sold in the market. But when you have a genetically modified mosquito or a honeybee, you cannot call them back. So you have to have proper guidelines for trials, etc. as well. Third problem, uncertainty of the ambit. Means the guidelines say that standard operating procedures have been made for mosquito, crop, pest, but they can also be used for beneficial insects. What are the beneficial insects? There is no clarity on that. The guidelines have to be much more clear. They have to be much more accurate, much more specific on what beneficial insects can be conduct trials or not. What benefits are they talking about? There is no clarity on that as well. This is what the author here says that the guidelines need to be much more specific, need to take into consideration the idea that this if it has to contribute much more to the GDP of the country, it has to be taken much, much more seriously. This is how bioeconomy can help us in creating more jobs, in having much better industrial inputs in terms of better technology, better material. It can help against climate mitigation as well. And it can even help our biodiversity in the long run. The same guidelines that was released by the government of India, the same report, had this graph as well about how our bioeconomy earns money for us. Mostly it is biopharma. For example, creating enzymes that help you in creating or in treating a lot of diseases. For example, uh, the famous company Biocon. I don't know if you have heard of this. Biocon owned by Kiran Mazumda Shaw is a company that works in this area only. This brings us to the end of today's discussion. Here are a couple of practice questions that you must write an answer to on the student answer writing portal. Check each other's answers as well. Give each other feedback to learn from your mistakes. Reminding you, there's a workshop coming up for all of you on the 11th of November. Do register for that by the link given in the description of the video. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. with the next session of the Hindu News for Analysis. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.